Then let's continue with uh, the remaining of this chapter, introduction to proofs. This time, as sometimes uh, it might be easier to find a contradicting example for the given claim. So here, how to prove it in such cases. This is how to prove that a claim is a false one. So the simple solution is that we can find an example statement or example expression, which is contradicting the original claim. Or we may do a proof uh, which is stating that the initial claim is false. For instance, here we have an example. The initial statement, the original statement is that every positive integer starting from let's say one, two, two, three, and going to infinity is a sum of squares of three integers, every positive integer. So I may start with, where is yes. One is equal to sum of squares of three integers. So I can say that it's equal to squares of three integers, right? I'm sorry, I forgot to put it out. Okay. And then what about two is equal to squares of one, one, and zero. What about three? I can easily say that we can use one, oops, it should be always a two. And then once again, one square, four, four, I can write that is equal to square of two. Square of zero, square of zero. So what do you say? Is it a true one? Or how can I, how am I, how am I going to prove this one is true or not? Can you find a contradicting example? Can anyone suggest me a way of proving or disproving this statement? Any answers, any suggestions? Start writing a binary, writing numbers in a binary system. Somehow, but what about some higher numbers? If there is a suggestion from Ahmed, it says this number seven. Let's try to find if we can write seven. So how can I do it? Can I, I should actually start with two. If I do it, then I have some, if I have one more two, it will not be equal to, let's say, seven, it will be equal to eight. If I continue with one, then I can only write up to six. So which means that, as your friend points out, we have a contradicting example of this given statement. Seven is not uh, not equal to the sum of squares of three integers. So we can simply say that we have all found a contradicting example. So this is actually the statement is a wrong one. So what about another statement? Every positive integer is a sum of squares of four integers. This time, we, in the previous one, we had problems with seven, but now it's the sum of four integers, squares of four integers. I can simply write that. This is equal to, yes. Now, as you see, I obtain seven by using four different integers, four integers, not different, but four integers, squares of four integers. So can we find can we find a contradicting example to this statement? No, I can uh, there's a number eight, but I can easily do it. Eight is equal to Anyone can find a contradicting example? 
or no conflicting examples. Can you tell me a number which is contradicting with this statement? Chata is saying 88, but you can give it a try, Chata. I believe in you and you can find four integers for, let's say, squares of four integers. It's your, let's say, homework since this one is true. We should, you should find, you should be able to find a set of four integers who are, whose squares are, the sum of squares of these four integers should be equal to the given positive integer, which is 88 in Chartai's example. Chartai, this is your homework and you should find and tell us the four numbers, four integers, okay? So you see that sometimes it's quite difficult to prove this one. You cannot easily prove this statement and this is not our actually task. We cannot easily have a conflicting example for the previous one. Yes, it was easier. We stopped at 0.7, but for the other one, we don't have a conflicting example. And on the other hand, the proof of this statement is not that easy. And we have an answer to Chartai's number 88. Here you see, if you use, I didn't check, but probably it's true. If you use these numbers, integers, you obtain 88. So do you have questions, guys, up to now? Since I will continue with, uh, with again, proof by induction, but we will use different tools. We will use a checkerboard. Do you know what a checkerboard is? It's a kind of an, uh, let's say, game board. Uh, we have where we have just eight by eight or number is not that important. We have some squares. The thing is that uh, the horizontal and the vertical squares are the same. We have the same number of squares on the horizontal and the vertical lines. And we usually use, as you know, a board with eight rows and eight columns, and this is called as a standard one, standard checkerboard. We use the example, we play chess, we play other games on this standard checkerboard. Now we will use it uh, for showing some different ways, some geometrical proof methods. Yes, it's a very nice way, nice way of showing uh, the fundamentals of proofs. We can apply different approaches. So here we go. So the first question is, uh, can we tile this standard domino, standard, I'm sorry, standard checkerboard using dominoes? What is domino? It's uh, like a shape, a rectangular having two squares. So what do you think? Please unmute yourself and tell me if we can simply tile, tile the whole checkerboard just using this dominoes. What do you think? Yes, we can. <laughs> what do we do? Uh... Since we have uh, two n number of rows and lines, we can yeah, easily sixty four. Yes, and you say that in domino we have two squares, so we should yes. have thirty two. Yeah. Use thirty two dominoes, and it's not that complicated. You can simply use. I think it's better. I change the color of my pen. What about using green? Let's move right here. Yes, it's much better. So you can simply have two of them together. So you can easily cover or tile the complete standard checkerboard. So what about uh, removing one corner? Now, this is our case now, one square from the checkerboard. And now we have 
63 squares, right? Now, can we tile the concrete checkerboard by using just dominoes? Is it possible? Obviously not possible since we have an odd number here and you can only tile the checkerboards with even number, right? That's a simple, let's say, solution, a proof. I can say that if you remove a corner from the standard checkerboard, you cannot tile the complete checkerboard by using dominoes. You cannot do it, it's not possible. So what about removing upper and bottom corners? Right now, as you see, upper left and lower left corners are removed. This time, how many, let's say, squares do we have? We have 61. And if you use dominoes, then by using 31 dominoes, can you do it? Is it possible? What do you think? I want some answers at this point. Can we tile it by using 31 dominoes? No answer is yes or no, not that complicated. Or is that a trick? So two of you say no, three, no, two. Can anyone explain why we cannot tile it completely? You can, as I said, unmute yourself anytime. Teacher, may I? Sure. Like uh, normally if we take two, which is like connecting each other, if we take those two, we can use 31 tiles. But since we remove one from each tile, uh, the last row and the top row is odd numbered. So we cannot use two tile uh, dominoes to create well, what something about like that. It's an approach. You may start like this one and then have this one and this is. Yeah, somehow solve it, won't you? I'm not going to do the complete checkerboard, but why is not possible? Uh, can I say it? Yep. Okay, uh, in the normal chessboard, we have uh, 32 white and 32 black uh, yep. squares, but here we have 32 black and uh, I think, yes, 30 white square. Each domino, uh, Let's, let me help you. Uh, let's go back to the original board. So here you see we have the same number of white and red squares, right? 32 mm -hmm. and 32. But in the next slide, you see that I removed two white squares, which means that now I have 30 whites and 32, I'm sorry, uh, yes, 30 whites and 32 red ones. So go on, please, Steve. And each domino, uh, uh, one, uh, one uh, white and white, one uh, red square. So we cannot replace, uh, we cannot uh, fold the all square table yes. with one uh, white and white, one red uh, domino. Yes, thank you. This is a nice explanation since in the final configuration we have 30 whites. And I'm sorry, uh, yes, 32 reds. Which means that by using a, uh, if you another uh, actually approach we should use is that you can simply color your domino, okay? In the previous examples, we used two white squares, but you may have one white and one red square in the same domino, and you need to use the same type of domino during your tiling operation. And if you do it, you will not be able to finish it since at the end of it you need to have one domino which have actually two red regions which is not possible in this effort so we can say that it's not possible to 
tile, this checkerboard, which actually has 62 squares. It's not possible, so we can simply say that this is not true. We cannot do it. What about uh, this question? Right now, we have again a standard checkerboard. Now we are using straight three dominants. What is that? As you see the example, we have just three squares. Oops, sorry. Yeah. This is a straight three domino. And can we dial, uh, tile this complete checkerboard? We have 64 squares. And we have a three domino, set of three dominoes. Obviously, it's not possible since 64 is not divisible by three. So we can simply say that we cannot use straight terminals to tile the complete standard checkerboard. So what about this one? Now what we have done, we have removed one item, one square from the topmost corner, top, uh, rightmost corner. What do you think? Is it possible this time to tile this checkerboard by using straight three dominoes? Now I have 63 squares. If you use three dominoes, then that means you should use 21 straight three dominoes. But the question is, can we tile it by using 21? Three dominoes. What do you think? Again, you can unmute yourself, write it in the chat area, but I prefer to hear your voices. Okay, any answers? There's no answer, then I assume that is, is it possible? I think you can assume that you can tile it. What do you think? As Melissa says, it's not possible. Ahmed, not possible. So please, can everyone explain why do you think it's not possible? No one. What about again using some colored, let's say, three dominoes? If you remember in the dominoes case, we had white and red colors, but this time, since we are using three dominoes, it's better we have another color on the standard checkerboard, like this one, for instance. And again, if you have Let's say a three amino with three colors. It will be quite this time easier. But the thing is that once you remove, let's say gray here from here, then you should count the number of, let's say reds, grays and whites and see whether it's possible or not. So this is your task. You should check whether we can tile this checkerboard if one of the corners is removed. You can do it on this corner, on the left bottom corner or right bottom corner, it's up to you, but this is your task, please play with it if it's possible or not. Now let me uh, jump to a bit different type of triomino this time. It's called as L-shaped triomino. This is an L-shaped one. We have three squares this time, but they're not straight, obviously. The shape is an L. And now again, we are trying to cover this whole checkerboard. We'll try to cover it. Again, one of them is removed. So what do you think? Can we simply tile this checkerboard with one corner removed using the L shape? Three amino's. 
What do you think again? Is it possible or not possible? Why it's not possible? Why possible? So everyone says up to now, yes, how it is possible? Actually, we will use proof by induction in this uh, method. Okay, while proving this problem, this statement, we will prove that this is actually true. And we will use proof by induction. So in proof by induction, if you remember, we can divide this problem into smaller steps. So this is our Senate checkerboard. Now I can divide it into four squares, this checkerboard. Or I can further divide it into, let's say, four smaller ones. Yes, now here we go. I decrease the size of the problem to two by two checkerboard. In the smallest case, I can have two by two. So is it possible to tile it? I can put an L-shaped triomino, but one corner will be empty, right? What about the other one? I can use such a shape. And let me use another one here. And I will use another one. So if you look at these four, let's say, smaller size checkerboards, you always have one uncovered squares, right? There are four of them. And the thing is that if you arrange them properly, you can put another one extra here so that these three will be connected. They all will be covered. And if you look at this a bit larger checkerboard, this time it is covered with uh, L-shaped three ominos. And again, we have a corner which was removed. So this is fine for us. So I can say that starting from a smaller size, this was true actually in two by two, let's say checkerboard, we had all these three and it's all, uh, it's actually true for the initial statement. This is our checkerboard and I can fill it with an L-shaped triomino when the, one of the corners is removed. So for the basis, this is our basis and it is proved, right? And for the M plus one case, let's say, I decrease, increase the size of this checkerboard to four by four. And this time I use a smaller checkerboard. So we have four smaller checkerboards. I simply put L-shaped triominoes into them. And then as you see at the center, if you put one more L-shaped triomino, then you will be done with the uh, N plus one case. If here N is let's say two, and here we have N is four. Since we can, we need to use even numbers. So the next one should be uh, another even number. This is a checkerboard, which is four by four. And by using the, let's say, previous expression or previous geometrical proof, I can prove that it's also true for n plus n is equal to, I'm sorry, four, by using an extra L-shaped triomino at the center. And again, we have one remaining at the topmost corner, top leftmost corner, rightmost corner. And this is actually the initial statement one of the four corners is removed. If you look at this four by four checkerboard, yes, one of the four corners is removed and we can tile the rest of the squares by using L-shaped three of units. Any questions, guys? This is how we use proof by induction in such geometrical problems. We decrease the size of the problem to a minimum. The minimum is in our case, 
n is equal to 2 and we have proved it for n is equal to 2 and then we try to prove it for higher n values and we use the previous let's say n value for that and after you have proved it, proved that it's also true for n plus n is equal to 4 then that means this is a true statement you can tile any let's say checkerboard if their single corner is removed with just using l shaped to your minus. Any questions? Okay. So this is what actually I discussed is summarized on the slides. We have 63 squares, so technically it's possible to anyone by using 21 L shade three ominous, we should be able to tile it. So our claim is any two to the K times two to the K board. In our example, in the basis case, we use K is equal to one. It can be tiled by using three ominous, L shape three ominous. This is an example of an two by two checkerboard. So this is basis and it's true. You can have different phases, different orientations. It's not important. So if you jump into the inductive steps, you need to show that uh, a board with a size of two to the power of k times two to the power of k should be tied. And we are assuming that this is doable, and then show that it's also possible for a size of k plus one. So what I have done in the previous slides, as you see, we have decreased the size of the problem. We obtained four quarters. And then I show that it's true for the smaller quarters. And then finally, I could conclude that the initial statement is true. This is what we have done actually, dividing the main checkerboard into four regions. And again, as you see, if you remove again one more corner from each and orient them properly, you can simply put in, let's say, L shaped triomino, and then you'll be done with this proof. So, this is actually done for the induction by, it's a proof by induction. I'm not going to talk about the details of proof by induction anymore and we will jump to the last type of let's say indirect type of proof any questions guys about the previous topics so now let's start the recursion somehow related to induction but there are always little differences it's a nice expression which is summarizing the recursion so it says that to understand recursion, you must understand, you must first understand recursion itself. So if you look at this expression, it's always calling itself. This is a fundamental idea in the recursive functions, recursive algorithms. The algorithm will call itself at some point in the algorithm. So if you look at the algorithmic way of this expression, this is our function. What is recursion? If you understand recursion, then okay, you are done. But if you don't understand the recursion, then you should call the function once again. And as you see in this function, we are calling the same function once again. So we call these type of functions, algorithms as recursive functions and algorithms. So here we simply try to divide the problem into some smaller instances. This is the main uh, motto. So we are trying to divide the problem into smaller aspects and then we will be solving the smaller, let's say, aspects by using smaller inputs. So once we have done it, then the algorithm will be much simpler. Its efficiency will be much better. So as I mentioned, it's very powerful. It decreases the context of your algorithm. So you'll see some examples throughout the semester. 
it's a kind of genius way of solving problems. Or uh, in another way, you can say that it's defining something in terms of itself. So since we are calling to functions inside the same function, so we are using the function itself to solve the same problem. So if you do that, obviously you will have some simpler solutions to your complicated problems. You'll see some examples in a moment. And this is a typical usage. If your problem can easily be decreased into some subtests, and then you can do recursion, but what do you need to do? You need to combine the results of these smaller instances after they have been completed. So this is the main, let's say, structure of the recursive functions algorithms. We divide them into some smaller parts. They do some computations. We, and, we then later try to combine, combine, try to sum the results of these subtests. So in the recursive definition, we need to have base case. Since we cannot start directly into the recursive function, we need to have some base cases, maybe for let's say n is equal to zero, n is equal to one cases. Once you have written them, then you can start writing the recursive, the main uh, body of the recursive function. And then depending on your approach algorithm, you need to have a closing, let's say, statements. For instance, this is a uh, set of even numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, not even numbers, but set of powers of two, right? Two, four, eight, 16, 32. So how we can write it in a recursive manner. This is our base case for the first item for, let's say, n is equal to one. The set should give us the value of two which is two to the power of n and n is one here. So it, it is equal to two. Then this is our recursive definition. What is that? S of n is equal to two times the previous value, the previous S value, but this time we will be using not n, but S of n minus one. So for the calculation of S of n value, we use, yes, assume that if this one is n is equal to four, then we should be using S of three. And here it was S of four. So we don't need to do any, let's say, uh, power computation. You can also do it like this one. So we use a 16. And if you look at it, uh, is equal to two times S of three. What is S of three? S of three is equal to eight. If you multiply the two, you will obtain S of four, which is equal to uh, S of two times S of three. So this is a primitive case, but uh, in that example, you may not have any advantage, but in other, let's say, recursive implementations, algorithms, you will have many advantages. You will simplify your problem, you uh, do less computation and try to obtain the same results. So this is how it proceeds. And it's another example, the factorial example. You can also write this factorial example in a recursive manner. Our base function for n is equal to zero, our function should be equal to one since otherwise we will have problems. The multiplication of any integer with zero will give us a value of zero. So what we do, we have this basis function f of zero is equal to one, but then for any other values greater than n, we should use, let's say f, is equal, f of n is equal to n times f of n minus one. So let's say we are trying to compute f of four. So if you don't want to use the recursive function, well, what you do, you simply multiply these four integers, right? This is how we do in the classical way. But if you use a, if you have a recursive function, what do you do? You use the 
value of the previous, let's say, function. The same function. So these are the same functions. So here, what is f3? f3 is f of 3 is equal to 3 times f of 2. And f of 2 is equal to 2 times f of 1. And f of 1 is equal to, I'm sorry, this one should be true. And we have 1 here. So this is actually the final expression for the f of 4. Uh, let me write it in such a manner. So if you have put these in each other, you'll obtain a longer expression, right? And the advantage is that, as I said, in the simple ones, it's quite difficult to see, but in more complicated cases, expressions, you have many advantages. Another advantage, by using such an approach, you can easily modify the integer function. Here's a multiplication n times the previous value, but you can have any expression here. Any questions, guys, up to now about the recursive functions, their simple definitions? So obviously, if you use such a, let's say, recursive function, you don't need to much worry about the proof, proof of this, let's say, algorithm. Once you write it, then you can easily say that it's already proved by induction. You don't need to spend time on it. So if you remember our tiling with the triominos, we can say that we have a kind of, a, we may have a recursive function and this recursive function, what's going to do, it will divide the larger, let's say checkerboard in the smaller ones and then fill them with uh, three ominos. So in the smallest, let's say, if you compare it with our factorial, in the bottom part of the, let's say, recursive function, we were using the base case, which is equal to f of zero, equals to one. And in this tiling case, our base function is, k in our base function, we have k is equal to one. So we will decrease the size of the problem to k is equal to one, and then continue with increasing the size of the problem up to, up to the original size. And this is another example by proving or solving your problem with recursive approaches. So what about Fibonacci numbers? So anyone tell me the Fibonacci numbers or maybe I can simply write. So you start with zero, one, and then you need to sum the previous two numbers. One, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, so it goes like that. What we do, we simply sum the previous two values for the next item. So for let's say n is equal to three, what I'm going to do, I'm going to sum f of one and f of two. So if you sum these two, you'll obtain the third one. So this is how we do it if you uh, write a function for it in a classical way, but without using, uh, let's say, a recursive definition. This is our method, this is our function Fibonacci, and it accepts non-negative integers. So for the zeroth item, since it starts from zero, or I, can, I think this one is assuming the first item is equal to n. So if n is greater than zero, what we do is simply output zero and y and the Fibonacci number is one. Let me once again, I'm sorry, write the Fibonacci numbers here. Yes. If n is equal to zero, yes, it outputs zero 
And that means the Fibonacci of the first item is zero. And then if n is not equal to zero, then we continue it. And let's say initial values for x and y in this function, since the uh, output is y, so for n is equal to one, it will output directly one, since it will not be able to go into this one. Uh, our n is equal to one, one minus one is zero. So our function will not be going to this for loop, but for let's say n is equal to two, we can simply go into this loop and see that our second item in the Fibonacci numbers is equal to one. And for n3, obviously this for loop will result in two which is equal to y here. But here you see, you don't use a recursive definition, recursive approach. We use our classical approach by using a for function. But if you do it with a recursive definition, it's much simpler. As you see, you don't have any other uh, intermediate values, z, x, y, it doesn't matter. But we simply call this function itself. This is the overall function if you want to series, if you want to numbers function. We have base cases for n is equal to zero. We need to return zero. If n is equal to one, we simply return one. But for the rest of the n values higher than one, we simply do, we simply call the same function once again and simply sum these two since in the Fibonacci numbers. We are summing the previous two values together. This is implemented here. Our simple recursive function is returning the summation of previous two values.